Okay. Uh, welcome everybody uh, to the second meeting of our Integrability Journal Club in this term. And today I'm happy to introduce Ife He from Sakli, uh, who will tell us about uh, geometrical four-point functions in the uh, Q state, uh, in the 2D critical Q state what's model. Um, please, Ife. Okay, thank you. Uh, you can hear me well? Yeah. Okay, good. It seemed the video frozen. But okay, I want to first uh, thank the organizers for giving me this nice opportunity to speak here. And I want to tell you uh, something about the two dimensional POTS model that I've been studying. Uh, this, is a, this talk is an extended version of a talk that I gave several weeks ago at IGST. <laughs> Uh, but now I'm going to fill in with more details, but I'm assuming that you have not seen that talk. So everything that I have said there will be repeated. Just want to know if there would like to ask people on, 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 on the last question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. I will continue. Yeah, yeah, thank you, please. Okay. Okay, so the title is uh, Geometrical Four Point Functions in the 2D Critical Q State POTS Model. Uh, this is based on these two recent papers. The first one, together with Linnea Grant Samuelson, Jasper Jacobson, and Hubert Salah. And the second one is together with uh, Jasper Jacobson and Hubert Salah. So here's the plan for the talk. We'll start with a brief introduction of the POTS model, and then uh, also the central object we're going to study, which is the geometrical correlations. And then after that, we'll slightly distract ourselves from the POTS model a little bit to make some connections between the POTS model and the minimal models. And then the part after that, I'm going to describe uh, the bootstrap problem for the geometrical functions in the POTS model. And in this last part, I will um, discuss some further aspects of the model, including the logarithmic nature and so on. So according to my plan, uh, at this part, I will set up the bootstrap equation and then it will be a good uh, point to take the coffee break. And then after that, we'll come back and look at the results. So let's start with the basics. Um, POTS model is defined on a lattice where at each side there is a spin variable sigma taking Q different values. And uh, between the two nearest neighbors, there's a, a ferromagnetic interaction. So we can then write down the partition function in this way where we sum over all the spin configurations. And this is well defined for integer values of Q larger than or equal to two. And in the case of Q equals to two, we have the familiar icing model. And uh, when the two uh, spins share the same value, they form a bond. So on the lattice, a spin configuration can also be seen as a configuration of such bonds. And the connected components of the bonds is called a cluster. So for the partition function, we can then rewrite it as a sum over diagrams of such cluster configurations. And for each uh, diagram, we have a certain weight, which is given by certain bond probability to the power of number of bonds, and this quantity Q to the power of the number of clusters. And in this case, the quantity Q enters purely as a parameter, so the model is analytic continue to arbitrary real values of Q. And in particular, for Q goes to one, uh, the model describes the percolation problem. Uh, for two dimensional square lattice, when this parameter V here takes the critical value square root of Q and Q between zero and four, there is a second order phase transition. So the model is described by a CFT. <coughs> And there's another equivalent description of the model, which is through the loops. Suppose we start with um, a certain cluster configuration, and then we can um, 
draw another lattice, which is by taking the midpoint of each plaquette. And then we can connect these dots to form the loops in such a way that they bounce off the clusters. And so this way, uh, a certain configuration of the clusters is translated into a configuration of the loops. So the partition function then can be written as um, summing over all kinds of diagrams of these loops and at criticality is given by an expression like this. And so we see that for each diagram, each loop takes a weight square root of Q. <clears throat> And the reason that we're interested in this uh, loop representation is that on the lattice, there's an algebra of these loop diagrams. It's called the affine temporally leap algebra. Uh, it's generated by some elements with their uh, algebraic relations. And the key point is that the representation of this algebra will give us the spectrum uh, in the correlation functions that we're going to be interested in. So now let's talk about the correlation functions. So is uh, your lattice always going to be a square lattice? Uh, no, I mean, we're, uh, I think if you are having some other kinds of lattice, the, this kind of critical value will be different. But since we're talking about a continuum limit in the CFT, it doesn't really matter what lattice we're studying. And, and you, you will always fix the number of sites in the lattice? So you're gonna scale it in some way? Oh, uh, you mean this factor here? Yeah. Ah. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure about this. So, okay. but what, what is the question? Oh, I just wondered, is, is, are, are you always going to have the same number of sites? Uh, or is that going to be like scaled to infinity or something? Or? Um. Yeah, I'm not sure. Well, probably it is some or all possible uh, configuration. I think uh, what's, uh, what's, what matters is uh, what's in the sum, right? Um, outside is some factor that... Okay. Thanks. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Well, I, I can ask you a related question, uh, actually. So uh, what's the status of this conformality? For example, I, I know that uh, mathematically rigorously it was proven by Stanislav Smirnov in case of triangular uh, uh, lattice for, for percolation and for Ising, Ising model, yes? So what about general Q? So it is, uh, it, is there a similar kind of proof or it is conjecture? That's it. Sorry, what proof of what? Uh, so the rigorous proof that the thermodynamic limit will be CFT, I, I know it was done by Stanislav Smirnov for percolation and for Ising model. Okay. Yeah, so, and uh, the question, is there a similar uh, rigorous proof for other Q or, or not? Yeah, I'm not sure the answer to the question, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I, d I did not know this proof. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll continue? Yeah, yeah sure. Okay, so uh, on the lattice, the most natural correlator to consider is the uh, spin correlator, and the spin, ver uh, spin operator is defined this way, which is the order parameter. And this is uh, well defined for uh, integer values of Q, but we want something more general, which is well defined for arbitrary real values of Q. And so for this reason, we are going to introduce the geometrical correlations, which are defined in terms of these clusters. So I'm going to take an example of a four point function that we're going to study and uh, to explain what these objects are. But of course, the definition works for arbitrary endpoint functions. Uh, so suppose we consider four sites on the lattice then we can calculate a probability quantity, which says that the point one three belongs to one cluster, which we're going to label with A here, and two four belongs to a different cluster, which we label with B. And then uh, we can represent this kind of probability with a, 
a picture like this, which would be convenient. So one, three has, uh, are in the same cluster, two, four are in a different cluster. And outside this, we can have some arbitrary configurations of clusters that we don't care about. So then uh, the expression will be given by summing over configurations like this. Each diagram has a certain weight then divided by the partition function. And this definition works for generic real values of Q. And this is the kind of geometrical correlations that we're interested in. So we're going to focus on um, four four-point functions like this. Uh, the first one we call PAAAA, which uh, we have the four points belongs to one big cluster and uh, then arbitrary configuration outside. And then the second one is PABAB, which we just explained. And then for the other two, we can also define similarly. And the goal uh, is to determine these most fundamental four-point functions in the POTS CFT. <clears throat> So as we said, for Q between zero and four, there's a, a CFT. So if we parameterize the Q variable in this way for X taking continuous values between one and infinity, then the central charge of the CFT is given by this expression, which goes from negative two to one. And from here, we see that the CFT is in general non-unitary. And uh, in the end, we'll also discuss that, in fact, it will involve some logarithmic multiplets for generic uh, value of central charge. And for the fields in the, in the CFT, we're going to use the CAC parameterization. So that means um, the conformal weight will be labeled by two indices R and S. And uh, in this case, uh, different from minimal models, these RS can be fractions. So the field that we're discussing are in general non-degenerate. In this notation, the order parameter, which is the spin operator, takes the indices one half and zero. So we're going to focus on the CFT four point functions and then study the bootstrap problem. And these four point functions will um, get contributions precisely from these four geometrical probabilities that we uh, introduced. Uh, is there some questions? I think there's something in the chat or? Ah, okay. That's a different thing, okay. <clears throat> So now we're going to look at some uh, connections between the POTS model and the minimal models. So why I suspect a relation with the minimal models from the first place? This is uh, motivated by, sorry, by this paper here, uh, where the authors made an attempt to bootstrap these POTS probabilities. They considered a four-point function of an operator whose conformal dimension coincide with the pot spin. And then using the constraints from crossing, they, they found a very simple spectrum for this four-point function, which is given by this. And then by comparing with the Monte Carlo simulation, they find that this four-point function gives a very good description of this pot's probability combination. But it was Anderson. Sorry, I, I missed what the superscript here mean, what D and N mean. Ah, sorry, I did not explain. So I'm going to say that this four point function is actually a um, four point function of the mi minimal models. So this D and N are just saying that these two operators come from the diagonal and non diagonal sector of the type D minimal model spectrum. But I will also get to that later. So. Yeah, so it was later understood that uh, this spectrum here is actually not the spectrum for describing the POTS probabilities, but only a very small subset of a much bigger POTS spectrum. And um, the correlation functions and uh, the spectrum here can be understood as an analytic continuation of the type D minimal models to a generic irrational values of central charge or we can also think of it as a non-diagonal generalization of the C less than one Liu view theory. So then uh, it was quite mysterious why uh, this 
minimal model for point function analytic continued can give a good description of the POTS model. So this will be the first thing that we try to understand. <clears throat> so the, uh, the strategy we're going to take is to look at the minimal models on the lattice. And there is a known lattice realization of the minimal models, which is given by the RSOS model of the ADE type. In this model, each lattice site is mapped to a site on the ADE thinking diagram. And so the reason that this is good is that in this model, there's also a natural formulation in terms of clusters and loops. So the partition function and the correlators can be written as uh, expansion in terms of these cluster or loop configurations. So what we're going to do is to look at the four point function of this minimal model operator, which has the same conformal dimension as the pot spin, but look at it on the lattice and to understand what is its cluster loop expansion. And then from this, we understand more precisely how it's related to these uh, POTS probabilities. <clears throat> so this is what we found. Uh, we take the type D uh, minimum model as an example. In this case, there are two uh, operators which have the correct dimension that coincide with the POTS spin. And they fall into the diagonal and non-diagonal sector of the uh, minimum model spectrum. So we find on the lattice that uh, it's given by the expansion in terms of cluster and loops, precisely like the ones we're interested in the case of POTS. So the first one uh, is a sum over diagrams that have the configuration AAAA. That means the four points belongs to one big cluster, or this is also equivalent to that the four points uh, are wrapped by one big loop. And the second term uh, is the type ABAB. So we have 0.13 belongs to one cluster and 24 belongs to a different cluster. And of course, outside these, uh, there can be arbitrary configurations of these clusters and loops that we don't care about. But uh, in this case, the weighing of these diagrams are different. So for the loops that are contractible, on a four time punctured sphere, they take the usual weight square root of Q. And for the loops that are not contractible, for example, this very thin loop that I draw here, wrapping around two of these points, um, their weight is given by a sum over the eigenvalues of the adjacency matrix of the thinking diagram. So this, we see the difference with the case of pots. In the case of pots, all loops will have weight square root of Q. So then uh, this four point function should actually be given by the following combination of the geometrical quantities. The first one is uh, actually the POTS PAAAA uh, because in this case, when you have all four points belong to one cluster, all loops are contractible on the sphere. So there's no difference between this and the case of POTS. But uh, for the second quantity, we're going to call it a pseudo probability. It is given by the same uh, sum over diagrams as the POTS probability PABAB, but uh, for the loops that are non-contractable, their weights are non-trivial. And the difference between this quantity and the POTS probability PABAB involves some very uh, unlikely configurations with multiple loops wrapping around these uh, clusters. So that explains why it's hard for uh, Monte Carlo to, to detect the difference. <clears throat> and so now, <clears throat> let's back, uh, go back to the case of POTS. And we're interested in these four uh, probability quantities. And the first thing we want to know is what are the spectrums appearing in these uh, four point functions. So if we consider them as this uh, four, point four point function of the CFT um, uh, operator uh, of the spin, 
then uh, it has a conformal block expansion like this. The coefficients here, which we're going to call the amplitude, is given by the OP coefficient square. And depending on which of these correlators we're discussing, the spectrum involved will, involved will be different. And so we'll also get different amplitudes, uh, which we're going to label with this. Um, so the spectrum here was uh, recently found in this paper. They are given by um, the representations of the affine temporal leap algebra, which describe these loops. And each of these modules of the algebra contains a tower of conformal primaries and descendants. And we can read their conformal weights uh, from the labels in the algebra, which contains the following two type. And so combinations of these uh, modules W will enter each of these four point functions. And also the same module could also appear in different four point functions. And to give you a, a brief idea, I'm plotting here the total conformal dimension as a function of uh, the parameter Q. And the blue here is this very dense pot spectrum found in this paper. And uh, in comparison, I'm also plotting in red, the minimal model spectrum, which is analytic continued to generic values of central charge, which covers a very small subset of the pot spectrum. So there are two things I want to point out about this spectrum. Uh, first is that in this type of module, we encounter some uh, conformal primaries that has integer indices RS, and that means uh, they have degenerate conformal weight, which means the descendant uh, at level Rs becomes null. In this case, these null descendants will decouple, and so these are what, what is usually called the CAC modules, and we're going to use this degeneracy later. But in the second type of module, we also have some uh, integer RS indices when this P here is equal to zero. So we get this type of RS indices. So again, we'll have some degenerate conformal weights, but in this case, uh, the null descendant does not decouple, and this will lead to the logarithmic modules in the pod CFT. <clears throat> so could you say a little bit about this diagram? Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, which one? This one? Uh, though, though, yeah, because it, I mean, <laughs> so it, it just looks like completely different curves if I'm looking at it. Ah, because the red one is covering the blue one, so. Uh, ah, so the red one is always has a blue one on top of it? Uh, yes, it's, uh, it's part of okay. it. It's I see, I see. Probably uh, but I there's much of more of the, of the blue one. As yes, you yes, yes, yes. Okay, thanks. Um, so one interesting thing is that using the same approach that the pods spectrum were extracted uh, in this paper, we can also get the spectrum of these pseudo probabilities that we just defined. And we find that uh, they involve almost the same conformal fields as the pods probabilities, but with some different amplitudes. And so uh, we also made some uh, observations on the lattice about how these spectrum appear in these two different quantities. And uh, we also observe that uh, such observations actually does not depend on the lattice size. So it will carry to the continuum limit uh, appearing in the CFT. So I'm going to state them directly in the field theory language. So suppose we have a field which appear both in a POTS probability, let's say P A B A B, and a pseudo probability P tilde A B A B. Then the ratio of their amplitudes depend only on which affine temporary leap module it belongs to and the parameter Q. And second, if uh, the same field appear in different pods probabilities, then the ratio of their amplitudes also only depends on the module W that it, it belongs to and the parameter Q. <clears throat> and so on the lattice, we managed to extract many of these ratios, which are given by rational functions of Q 
But for the moment, we don't have a, a derivation of these ratios from a first principle. But later in this talk, after we get the bootstrap result, I'm going to go back to these ratios and uh, discuss that there's a way to understand some of them from a field theory perspective. <clears throat> So uh, now I'm going to discuss the bootstrap problem of POTS. Uh, so first, what have we learned from these amplitude ratios? What we were doing is first, we compare two objects. One is the POTS probability P, A, B, A, B, for example. And uh, the other one is this um, pseudo probability P, tilde A, B, A, B, which appears in the cluster formulation of minimal models. And uh, in, they involve the same cluster configurations, but the weighing of the diagrams are different. And second, we, uh, we also compare like different POTS probabilities which have different cluster configurations. And the fact that these amplitude ratios depend only on the affine temporally leap module means that uh, when we make such comparisons, only a global amplitude associated with an entire a fine temporally leap module is different. And the relation between different fields belonging to the same module is fixed. So from here, uh, I'm going to define an object which we call the interchiral conformal block. It organizes the usual conformal blocks of the fields belonging to the same affine temporally leap module together into a single object. And the key point is that it's the same interchiral blocks that appear in different POTS probabilities and the pseudo probability. And the name behind this is that in an earlier work studying on the lattice, um, the authors suggested that there was a, a interchiral algebra, which is the extension of the usual Virasura times the Virasura bar via the fusion with the degenerate field uh, with conformal weight H21. And so uh, later we'll also see that this degenerate field will play an important role in constructing these interchiral blocks and also uh, in the logarithmic nature of the CFT. So now we can write down uh, these geometrical quantities as a expansion in terms of these interchiral blocks, summing over all the affine temporally leap modules that uh, in, appear in the spectrum. Uh, with some overall amplitude. And one interesting thing from here is that we can actually extract some of the POTS amplitude from the well-known minimal model amplitudes. So let's consider this uh, combination of the POTS uh, PAAAA with the uh, pseudo probability P2 the ABAB. For each of these objects, we can uh, write the expansion using the interchiral blocks with some uh, amplitude. So on the left hand side, we get this. But we also said that this combination is actually a minimal model four point function. So the amplitudes for the fields are actually known. And I'm labeling them with this AL because ultimately it comes from the C less than one Liouville theory, which is analytically known. So if we compare now the left-hand side and the right-hand side, we can write down this equality here uh, relating the well-known minimal model amplitudes uh, with the unknown pulse amplitude and this A to them. And then we can rewrite this expression in this way. And we see that here, these are the amplitude ratios that we determine on the lattice, although we don't understand them completely yet. But we can then plug in the expressions, uh, then use this equation, we can extract the POTS amplitudes from the well-known minimal model amplitudes. And I'm giving here some of these examples of such expressions. So one key point is that uh, this will only work for the fields which actually do appear in minimal models, meaning that the AL here does not vanish. So as we have seen in this comparison of the spectrum, there are many fields which uh, disappear from the minimal models but remain in the pots. So let's say there's a mod module which does not belong to minimal model spectrum but appear in PAAA. 
that means uh, the AL would be zero, but the AAAA is not zero. So then that means what's in the parentheses has to be zero. And uh, for this, we also checked using these numerical ratios that were found on the lattice, and it's true. So this gives us some confidence about this correctness of these ratios that's ex extracted on the lattice. And for this kind of fields, we're going to use a bootstrap to find these uh, amplitudes in pots. <laughs> so, Mr. To, sorry, can I ask, like yeah. physically speaking, so the spectra, as you showed us, are quite uh, different, uh, or at least uh, they, they're not exactly the same. Why would you expect that the, the amplitude, the, the four point functions would be the same? Is, is there some, or at least in these cases, is there some, uh, reason? Uh, what do you mean by four point function to be the same? Well, I, I sorry, may, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but you're saying that roughly speaking, the four point functions are the same. Uh, uh, so what's the... happening is uh, in this kind of uh, pseudo probabilities, we also observe all these uh, fields which appear in the case of pots and mm -hmm. uh, also in this, but this certain combination of these geometrical quantities enter the minimal models. So, um, so then some of them from this combination will disappear. So minimal model has a very simple spectrum but uh, for each of these quantities. Yeah, exactly. And so, so is there some, some physics behind this cancellation? Mm. Or could you have expected it somehow? Maybe we can keep this for the discussion. Sure. Session because I need to think a bit. Okay, um, no okay. So, so now we want to do the bootstrap. And uh, for, to do that, uh, the first thing is to know what these interchiral blocks are. And to do this, we are going to use the fact that there is some degenerate field in the spectrum. Uh, so in particular, the energy operator, which has the conformal weight H21 is degenerate. And this leads to certain recursions in the amplitudes, which, which will help us construct the interchiral block. So let's review some um, this technique, which was actually used to solve the C less than one Liouville theory. And the key point here is that uh, when we fuse this degenerate energy operator with another field, the OP uh, truncate to only two terms. So one can then study a four point function, which involve one of these, um, degenerate operators. And then in both S and T channel, the expansion is just a sum over two terms with some amplitude times some conformal blocks. And since the four point function uh, has a degenerate operator, so the conformal blocks here are actually known solution of a certain differential equation. So we can then uh, write the relation of the amplitude in terms of these known blocks. And this will give uh, a recursion of the amplitudes when the R index is shifted by two units. And in the case of Liouville, we also have another field, which is degenerate, which has the conformal weight H12. And this leads to another recursion where the S index is shifted by two units. And in that case, by combining these uh, two recursions, le it leads to a full analytic solution of the theory. So, uh, but uh, in uh, the case of- Sorry, in, in this case, well, how do you know is the uh, OP truncates to just two terms and like well, what's the reason for that? Uh, it's because the, this field is degenerate. So, um, uh, and has index to one. So it's the usual degenerate fusion rule uh, that if you have this, you, Take the fusion. What do you mean by degenerate? In, in which sense is it? Degenerate? It means that the descendant at um, level two uh, decouples. Yeah, it means that uh, one of the descendants is primary at the same time. Yes. But by, by the way, I am actually not very familiar with temporary. 
algebra, so what's the structure of modulus of this algebra? It is uh, highest weight, so some, some, or something else. The affine temporally leap. Yeah, what, or, so the, what's the structure of this model? Which model? Mo modulus, uh, re representations of. Ah, modules, okay, so, so, I mean, uh, this is a, this is algebra on the lattice. And uh, so each of this module has um, a lot of primaries and their descendants in it. And these primaries are related by shifting the R index by one unit. Uh, I don't know if that answered the questions. Uh, so, well, can I think about it in ladder operators? I have something and I act by all words in ladder operators and produce everything. Um, like... so, so the affine temporary leap algebra is generated by some elements like this. And so basically it's the algebra of these these loops on a, uh, on a lattice. Um, yeah, yeah, but, but it's a question about representation, yeah, the structure of representation, but okay, so it's not crucial. We can postpone. I mean, I, I don't know a lot about the detail because it's more lattice stuff, but I know that people understand these by studying the um, transfer matrix and then, uh, but one has to take care of these uh, eigenvalues in the transfer matrix to um, make sure it keep track of these link patterns and all that. But um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. By, by the way, we are approaching uh, the coffee break slowly, yes. Already? Uh, no, slowly. Oh, <laughs> so okay, yeah, it's almost- uh, five minutes. Okay. okay, so this slide is done. So I think I have two more slides. Okay. Um, so, um, so now we want to construct these interchiral blocks. Uh, so we need to find the re uh, relation of the amplitudes for these fields. And these are actually a stronger version of the amplitude recursion, which uh, the R index is shifted by one unit. So uh, that means we're going to look at the four point function of the spin operator and then consider a intermediate channel where we have R plus one S and R S. And this amplitude recursion is given by uh, the OPE coefficient square. So I'm just gonna give a key ingredient for how to get this recursion. And the, the point is to look at a crossing equation of uh, this four point function, where we have two spins, uh, one arbitrary field RS and the degenerate energy operator. So in the S channel, by fusing with the spin, we get a minus one half zero, which is again, the spin operator because of this symmetry in the indices. And then the T channel by fusing this uh, with the arbitrary field RS, we get R plus one S. So from this crossing equation, we, from these two vertices, we get the OP coefficients of fusing two spin with these fields that we want to get the recursion. And so from this equation, we can get this uh, ratio that we want times some other stuff from these other vertices. And the result is a known uh, expression given in terms of the blocks. And then these other stuff, we can remove them by studying two more two point functions like this. And in the end, we get the recursion we want. And so then to construct the block, we sum over the Virasoro block with these recursions where all the fields belong into the same uh, module. And then uh, we are ready to bootstrap. So the bootstrap equation relates these four probabilities through crossing. And so for each of the, this equation, we should understand it like the following. For take the third one as an example, uh, for the, we take the spectrum from AABB with its amplitude and expand using the S channel blocks. And on the right hand side, we have the spectrum from ABBA with its amplitude and extend, uh, expand using the T channel block. 
And uh, just to be clear, this amplitude here, we can choose the usual amplitude in front of the usual Verasura block um, for some fields uh, with the lowest dimension in the module. And then this is a linear equation of these amplitudes that we try to solve. So we can put it into the numerics and then solve for them. This way we determine these uh, geometrical four point functions. So now I think we can take the coffee break. Oh, great, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So I don't know, maybe there are a few short um, questions about the first part. Maybe I, I can ask actually one short question. So from the very beginning, you said that yeah, Q here is just parameter, yes? So yeah. one can think about analytical continuation and I wonder, uh, and this uh, tra, for example, stuff also can be formally continued in Q. So do you see any signs of this uh, complex CFT for Q more than four as, uh, as it appears ah. in uh, Richkov, uh, Garbien? Kazan paper. So uh, you're trying to take the Q to be a complex value or? No, uh, well, uh, do you know their paper? So they took uh, Q, Q more than four and yeah. then uh, real, uh, and then it um, uh, will be test transition of first order, yeah. but uh, there are two complex, uh, two complex CFTs. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and they calculated something. Yeah, and, yeah. So, in the question, uh, if your setup is um, uh, quite general and uh, knows about Q just as parameter, so can you see something about this uh, complex CFTs? Uh, for, and uh, for the moment, no, but. Um, I mean, for the moment, uh, I don't have a clear motivation to look at uh, these complex CFT for the case of POTS. Um, but mm -hmm. I think it, I'm, I'm not sure how to answer the question, sorry. Okay, okay. But, but analytically, is there some singularity in uh, Q equal four, I don't know, some poles, uh, cuts, or something like this on level of formal logic? Um, I mean, for the for correlation functions that we're studying, are, are you? Sorry, hello? You cannot hear me? Uh, no, no, I, I can, yeah. Okay, are you, are you trying to say that uh, let's take the correlation function as uh, a function of Q and then look at its analytic structure and see uh, whether it has some kind of cuts at Q larger than four or something? No, some cuts is, yeah. Ah, I, I don't think we're there yet. Um, it's, um, I mean, you have to understand it as a function of Q very well to do that, right? Mm. Okay. Okay, good. So then uh, I pause the record link and we go for to grab our coffee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so I'll continue. Yeah, please. Okay, so uh, now I'm showing uh, the bootstrap results on these amplitudes that we wrote on the, uh, in the bootstrap equations. So the red are the amplitudes that appear in this uh, probability P A A A A and blue are for the A B A B and green is for the A A B B. And so from here, uh, I'm plotting all these amplitudes uh, as a function of Q. And so we can see clearly their analytic structure as a function of Q. And uh, I will discuss in more detail of this uh, soon. But uh, before that, we look at this comparison with the lattice result, which is an important check uh, of the bootstrap result. So the crosses are from the lattice and the red and blue dots uh, like here are from bootstrap. And I'm plotting some of these uh, as a function of Q. 
So you can see that uh, the two agree very well uh, in terms of the order of magnitudes and uh, the analytic structure as a function of Q and also the generic behavior uh, as a function of Q. But uh, there are some small differences uh, for fields that are, high, that are high on the spectrum, which uh, is reasonable since the lattice has some finite size corrections. But um, this comparison give us some confidence that we are indeed bootstrapping the correct results. Could I, could I also normally, I mean, depends on which version of bootstrap you use, but normally it would give some exclusion regions. Uh, uh, so this is uh, different from the, the unitary bootstrap because this is a non-unitary theory. So what we are actually doing, since we have the whole spectrum, is to solve these uh, equations in some region of ZZ bar and then uh, solve for these amplitudes. So that's the, uh, so we're interested in these amplitudes, but of course we do it by choosing uh, one value of Q and then next value of Q, which creates this kind of plots as a function of Q. So uh, what I want to talk about now is to look at some more details of these amplitudes. So I'm going to take the example of this module, which is labeled by uh, W21. It includes, um, conformal primaries with the following RS indices. And if we look at its amplitudes, which appears in the probability AABB, then we see that it has a pole at Q equals to one, which is the percolation point. But uh, the same module also appear in this probability PAAAA. And if we look at its amplitude there, there's no such pole. And this difference in the analytic structure of the amplitude is also reflected on this um, amplitude ratios that we got numerically on the lattice. So um, it's natural to suspect that this difference in the amplitude for this module is due to different spectrums appearing in these two different geometrical four-point functions. So if we look at the spectrum, and indeed for the PAABB, we have an extra module, which we label here with the W bar, uh, which doesn't appear in the AAAA. And this is a, a series of primaries with their descendants with the RS indices taking these values, which in particular uh, includes the identity field. So what I'm going to explain now is how to understand these uh, difference in the analytic structure of the amplitudes from this difference in the spectrum. So if we look at, uh, at Q equals to one, the conformal dimension of the identity field coincide with the degenerate conformal weight, which is H12. And so that means if we look at uh, its conformal block, it involves a term that is degenerate, sorry, divergent. And uh, the dependence on Z here is given by some block of um, descendant field. And the coefficient here has the divergence. And similarly, we have that for the Z bar. <clears throat> so, uh, this co divergent coefficient here takes the form uh, with some number with a pole at Q equals to one, and the, the remaining contribution because of this co coincident dimensions takes a regular part of the uh, conformal blocks of H12. <clears throat> so the contribution of identity field in this four point function is by combining these left and right blocks, which will include a term that looks like this which has a, a coefficient that has a pole at Q equals to one, and the Z dependence is given by some block combinations like this. But for this uh, geometrical four point function, which is a probability, we don't expect it to have a singularity as a function of Q, it should be smooth. So that means we need some other contribution to cancel this divergence in this a four point function. And if we look at the behavior in Z here, this is precisely given by the block of this field H12, H1 minus two that belongs to this module. 
So what we want is that its amplitude will have some, um, also have a pole at Q equals to one with some opposite um, residue such that when combining it with the identity field, it, uh, the divergence cancel out. And of course, we don't expect this to happen for the probability AAAA since the identity field is not part of the spectrum there. So then by comparing these two amplitudes, the ratio should have a pole at Q equals to one. And um, then we can see that we can actually extract the exact amplitudes in AAAA as a residue of the amplitudes in AABB here, because this residue here are completely determined by the conformal blocks. But so, uh, sorry, sorry why, why there couldn't be some uh, small uh, parts on the right hand side? Uh, you only know that residues are equal in principle, right, from this consideration. Yes. Uh, I mean, uh, you just draw it equal, it should be like approximately equal when Q approaches one. In the last uh, one. Which, this expression? Yeah. From what you said, your argument is based on cancellation of some poles. So I don't see how yes. could it give like exact uh, ratio for any Q. It no, it's, uh, it's only one. at Q equals to one that you can extract this. Because yes, this so. happens at okay. Q equals to one, yes, yes. So uh, then we get this exact amplitudes for this module in AAAA at Q equals to one, which is given by this expression. And I plot, I'm plotting here this as a comparison with the bootstrap result in the nearby region. And we see that it interpolates smoothly uh, between the bootstrap results, which give us some more confidence on the bootstrap results. Okay, so the story about the bootstrap more or less end here. And uh, in this last part, I'm going to discuss some further aspects of the model. <clears throat> so we'll start with a summary. We are interested in these uh, geometrical four point functions. And uh, if we take the example of this one, we uh, write it as uh, expansion in terms of the interchiral blocks with uh, summing over all the affine temporal leap modules and with some overall coefficients, which are the amplitudes. So um, we have used a comparison between pots and minimal models to argue that this interchiral blocks does exist. And we also constructed uh, explicitly using the degenerate energy operator. And for the amplitudes here, uh, on one hand, for some of them, we managed to extract them using uh, from minimal models. And on the other hand, we also bootstrap the rest. And so uh, what I want to talk about now is some further uh, aspects of these two parts. Uh, I'm going to look at the logarithmic modules which appear in some of these mo modules here and also um, picture some um, possibility of uh, finding these amplitudes analytically. <clears throat> so we start with the uh, log logarithmic nature. And uh, if you remember that many slides ago, we have said that in the spectrum, there are, the, there are some modules which has this indes, uh, integer RS indices, which means that they have the degenerate conformal weight, meaning that uh, their descendants at level RS is null. But in this case, uh, in the case of pots, this null descendant does not decouple from the theory. So uh, this will lead to some logarithmic um, multiples and we'll take the philosophy of the early days of logarithmic CFT to focus on the divergences uh, from these degenerate conformal weight in the OPE and then uh, to see how to cancel, uh, cancel these divergences, which leads to the logarithmic multiplets. So let's consider an example where the RS are one, two. And then if we take the OP of two operators, which you can think of it as the spin operator, such that the uh, field we're talking about appear in the spectrum of the geometrical four point functions. 
then the OP will contain some uh, this kind of stuff that we have this primary field 512 and a null descendant at level two. And the operator A here is a combination of the Verisor generator, which gives a node descendant at level two. And the coefficient in front uh, will have a divergence, uh, which usually means that the descendant should decouple, but in the case of pods, it doesn't. So we are going to try to understand now how to cancel this divergence. So, uh, so let's consider making a small shift of this conformal dimension with a small um, parameter epsilon and take the limit epsilon goes to zero. And then uh, the OP will take this form and the divergent um, coefficients goes like one over epsilon here. So we're, now we introduce another field whose conformal dimension will approach the dimension of this descendant in the limit of epsilon goes to zero with some arbitrary coefficients. And the purpose of this field is to cancel the divergence. And then if we take the most divergent part of the original OPE, which goes like one over epsilon square by combining the left and right, and then we can define another field, which is this part plus the the, uh, this other field that we introduced, now we can calculate its two-point function. And for its two-point function to be finite in the limit of epsilon goes to zero, it requires the behavior of this arbitrary coefficient to go like this. And the, the specific behavior can actually be uh, found using the degeneracy of this energy operator. And then this limit of the two-point function uh, will have a logarithmic uh, dependence in the ZZ bar. And then uh, the remaining field, which appear at the same level with the same conformal dimension, it comes from combining the left part of this node descendant with the right part of uh, this new field. And we can calculate all the two-point functions at this level, which give us this form. So this uh, is the standard form of uh, uh, the two-point function of a rank two Jordan cell. So we identify that the field phi together with this other field forms a rank two Jordan cell. And this kind of thing uh, exists at generic values of C. And here I'm just giving an example of when the RS indices are taking one, two. And then one can combine um, two pairs of OPE and to construct the logarithmic conformal blocks, which in this case will not uh, factorize into left times right because of this log ZZ bar dependence. And this is a, a, gen, a general structure appearing in the uh, POTS model. So I'm going to finish. Can I, can I ask a question? Sorry. Yeah. So it looks as uh, regularization, yes, for an epsilon. Uh, yes. How unique is this um, procedure? Can you add another terms, uh, which also will make consolation? Um, uh, you mean like a different term here? For example, yeah. yeah. Uh, there could be Jordan, Jordan cells of bigger uh, Size, I guess but that that happens thing. only at the rational central charge. So for generic central charge, it's only the rank two Jordan cell. Mm. So what's the motivation to adding another term? It's the same motivation, but just uh, the question: Is it possible to add something else and also make it? How unique uh, is this thing? Mm. Uh, it's quite a specific situation which is being considered, right? So there are many ways to this could be cancelled. For example, if it was a Jordan cell of size three. I think I think there's an important point that uh, the 
the degeneracy of this energy operator leads to this type of behavior, which makes sure this cancellation. But uh, for introduce some other stuff, it I don't know if it will work. Okay. But, but by the way, uh, it is assumption. If, if, if it works with less stuff, with more stuff, it will work even better. <laughs> uh, well, maybe it's unique. Maybe you can. Maybe you don't have such freedom. You know. But by the way, as this this fields, for example, it is assumption or not that uh, when you add these fields, they it exist uh, or it uh, exists? ah this actual thing. Yeah. I, I think the thing, uh, what's behind this is probably the, the C less than one Liouville theory, because we're shifting this um, RS indices to some kind of uh, arbitrary fractions, and uh, these kind of fields exist in the Liouville. And um, I think in a sense, this logarithmic structure can be understood in the pods, can be understood as certain limit of the Liouville theory. I, is that the question? I forgot. Well, uh, yes, the question was, uh, does this field exist in the theory? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. And you answer, as I understood that if I think about it as a limit of Liouville, then yes, right? That's what you yeah. Mean? That, that's my understanding. I mean, not, not really understanding, but my intuition. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so I'm going to finish with this observation here uh, on the amplitudes. So uh, we have said earlier that for this non-diagonal C less than one Liouville theory, uh, we have another field, which is degenerate and that leads to another set of recursions of the amplitude. And uh, uh, in terms of this language of a fine temporary leap, this actually relates the amplitudes for different uh, modules in this way. And in that case, uh, we also have the degeneracy of H21, which also exists in pods. And by combining these uh, two sets of recursions, one gets a full analytic solution of the theory. But uh, we know that this other field is not degenerate in the case of pods, and we have just saw that, that the corresponding conformal weights leads to some logarithmic modules. So then in the case of pods, we don't have this other degenerate, uh, this other recursions. But what we have observed is that in the case of pods, we have a renormalized version of this Liouville recursion, which means that if we take the amplitudes uh, of two modules related this way, it's given by the usual Liouville recursion uh, multiplied by some actual factor, which is a rational function in Q. And uh, these so far are mainly extracted from the bootstrap results or the lattice results, and uh, we don't know how to get these. But the fact that such expression exists seems to suggest that we might be able to find these amplitudes uh, analytically. And for this, I think uh, perhaps one important thing first is to understand what happens to this degeneracy, what replaces that in the case of pods, and how that leads to this kind of rational functions, which I think is one of the most important open problems of the model. And thank you. That, that's it. Thank you. Um, okay, questions? Uh, yeah, could I ask a question? So in terms of the numerical um, uh, bootstrap which you were using, could you give some detail on like uh, how many states, uh, at which level you had to truncate uh, something? Ah, yes, yes. So um, <clears throat> let me go back to that. I mean, uh, the point is that uh, for once you construct these interchiral blocks, then the amplitude that you need to bootstrap is really just a few because most of the amplitudes are summarized in these recursions. So um, if you... So 
sorry. I want to go back to the spectrum. <clears throat> So if you look at the spectrum, I think uh, the result that I'm showing here is truncated at uh, this line, which uh, if you look at the uh, fine temperature label, is J less than four. So you have uh, this kind of total dimensions. But after you organize uh, all the fields according to these modules, then I think maybe just um, uh, five or six amplitudes that you need to bootstrap. Uh, in the bootstrap, we also used this lattice uh, result of how the different amplitudes in the different probabilities are related. So that's some extra constraint that helps with the numerics. So you can pose them at some time because uh, you also mentioned that you actually check them with bootstrap, but I guess you, you did both. <clears throat> ah, yes, yes. And then another question. So in terms of the analytic uh, dependence on Q, if, if you look at yeah. the numerics of your amplitudes, it looks like, I don't know, there is some kind of square root when Q goes to zero, or do you know what is the analytic structure expected as a function of the complex Q? Like in principle, you can solve it for any value of Q, right? The same way. It uh, would be complex, you shouldn't uh, really. But, but I don't understand if you have a complex Q, you don't have a CFT anymore. Well, uh, I mean, you, you still have your equations, right? So uh, which one are you talking about? Oh, okay. About? In other words, I could ask, uh, how do you, uh, how does the dependence on Q enters into equations? It enters through the spectrum, right? Mostly. Uh, uh, it's the conformal weight of the spectrum, yes. Right. So, so you have the same of... set of labels, but the conformal weight depends on Q. Q is basically central charge. Yeah, so you, you can compute the, the spectrum, I guess, as an analytic continuation, right? If you have function, yeah, you can analytical continue. So I don't know how analytic your spectrum is, but assuming it is, there is some analytic formula that is defined for any Q, so then you can do bootstrap uh, at any Q even complex and then uh, see what the analytic properties. So maybe you will absorb more poles outside uh, this interval. Yeah, yeah, so maybe. Range cuts. So Brown, do you know, well, the second picture looks like there is a square root uh, at the origin. This, this one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it would be interesting to go around the origin uh, numerically and see whether there is a branch cut. Okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, that would be interesting. I mean, some of the motivation here is mainly to use the POTS model to understand the percolation, which is the Q equals to one. But perhaps there are more things that one could study about this. No, in a sense that if you know analytic uh, structure of the amplitudes, maybe you can uh, just write down analytic uh, function, which would have all these properties, and then you'll get- the I mean, these are, I think in general, given by some really complicated functions of gamma functions, ratios of gamma functions. Uh, yeah, then they wouldn't have um, square roots, right? Uh, they would only have poles and zeros. Yeah, yeah. So uh, do you know those functions already for this uh, AAAA? Is it non-analytically or you just... Uh... So some of the plots here, uh, if you see that it's like a pure uh, solid line, then these are the ones that we just said that we could extract from minimal models. So we know the analytic ones. And uh, the, dot, the dotted ones are from numerics. So for the analytic ones, I mean, usually, this is more convenient to be uh, to write it in terms of uh, another way of expressing the central charge, which is through the beta, which appears in the Liouville theory. This will be like the I times B or something like that. But then in terms of that, it's given by uh, ratios of gamma functions, and then there's some double gamma, uh, is it called double gamma function or something like that? Mm -hmm. uh, it's very complicated special functions. 
Then you found numerically that other amplitudes which are not known analytically, they, they're related to those by some rational factors. Is it what you're saying? Or? Yes, yes. It's uh, rational functions in Q. All right. So, you know, uh, in principle, you know all of them analytically. I mean, at least many of them. Ah. Uh, so at the end, which, which of those I, uh, on the screen, you know, uh, or you have like conjecture? Or? Um, so, so as I said, these solid lines are the ones that we know. And uh, then um, I think, so then in the end, I also showed that there are some ratios that's given by this known Liouville ratios times this actual factor. And I think uh, there are still some that cannot be written in this way, which uh, are not known. But mm. if the field appears, uh, if the, the, for the fields that are related through this relation that exists in Liouville, then uh, I think we know them through this uh, Liouville ratios plus the actual factors. And okay. then there's some other stuff, like uh, if you take the index um, for I here, and then uh, it's not related to other things by this kind of shift relation, then those we don't know. Just if you can write some kind of ansatz for amplitude in terms of ratios of gamma functions, maybe you can analytically uh, bootstrap them. Okay. Okay. Now, how in principle do you know about this uh, gamma functions, uh, uh, this form, how it comes? That's from minimal model, those which are fixed. Ah, it's just uh, this. Okay. So, so this, real, this kind of relations is also just like the way uh, to construct this interchiral blocks, which is some uh, recursion in the amplitude that results from the degeneracy. So it's basically, you look at these four point functions, uh, which involves one degenerate operator, and then uh, solve that second order differential equation, which uh, the basis of solutions is given by some ratios of gamma functions. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. And, uh, Any more questions? Yeah, so um, these minimal model plots connection that you're putting forward here, uh, there are supersymmetric uh, minimal models, you know, different models or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. Would you expect uh, there to be a connection to some uh, version of the POTS model as well? Uh, the, I, I don't know enough to answer the question. <laughs> but it's based on some diagrammatic uh, lattice uh, relations, right? So yes, the, yes. Are, are there... Uh, similar diagrammatic uh, lattice descriptions for those? Uh, I guess that was partly my question. Yeah, I, I don't know. I just learned about this RSOS model through this project that I didn't really know before. Okay, yeah. thanks. Thank you. So comments or questions? Not okay. If you don't have uh, any uh, other comments, sorry. I... sorry, Junior. Huh? You have a question, Andre? Yeah, yes. Yes. Um, okay. uh, just uh, do you know if is there an uh, integrable structure associated with with these models? Like in some simple CFTs, there is an integrability. Yeah, I I don't know that, but I mean for these, um, I know that. Collaborators uh, and student of Uvac Salah uh, have some other formulations in terms of spin chains, but I don't know too much details about that. Maybe but. there are no. Sorry? Yeah, you can look at perturbed Q state pots. That'll, people look at S matrices for perturbed Q state pots and try to make relations. I mean, there's a scattering theory for thermally uh -huh. perturbed. Yes. So the off-critical models is understood through integrability, or is that? Yeah. 
Um, yeah. Which uh, integrable QFT is associated with these models, Gerard? Is it known? Uh, uh, no, uh, I find the whole Q-state pots thing full of con people who disagree with each other. At least it was in the past. Mm -hmm. And thanks. Thank you. Okay, good. So if no other questions, um, we stop recording. Okay. Yeah.